It's deja vu all over again. Donald Trump's worst lawyer, trademark legal eagle, all rights reserved, Alina Haba, had a pretty wild time defending her client in his second defamation trial for things he said about E. Jean Carroll. Which is weird because she knows where her strengths are and it's not being a trial lawyer. Would you rather be smart or pretty? And I said, oh, easy, pretty. I can fake being smart. <laughs> oh, honey, no, you can't fake it. Trump's former lawyer, Joseph Takapina, left abruptly under mysterious circumstances. Um, I had to fo follow my compass, and, and my compass told me it was my time there was done. So Haba was lead trial counsel in Carroll Part 2, uh, where her lack of experience and general shadiness were on full display, resulting in an $83.3 million verdict against Trump. So let's unpack the horrible bungling of this case, what it means for Trump, and what happens next. Now, if you already watched the Legal Eagle video on the first E. Jean Carroll trial and verdict, you might be wondering why this is happening again. Well, kids, it's because time is a flat circle, and the vengeful gods won't be satisfied until we recreate everything about the last two presidential election cycles, including Trump bragging about passing a dementia test. Uh, yes, he did that again. Yeah, you know, they always show you the first one, like a giraffe, a tiger, or this, or that. A whale. Which one is the whale? And it appears that a $5 million verdict was not enough to stop Donald Trump from defaming people. To review, in 2019, writer and advice columnist E. Jean Carroll accused Trump of sexually assaulting her at a department store. Uh, she wrote a book about it, and after the book was published, then President Trump issued two statements accusing her of making it all up. Carroll sued Trump for defamation, saying that his comments uh, ruined her reputation, damaged her career, and quote, resulted in a slew of insults and threatening messages, emails, and comments to her social media accounts. The lawsuit stalled in federal court because the Department of Justice, then led by Bill Barr, concluded that Trump made his remarks in his official capacity as president, and he was therefore immune from that lawsuit. But although Trump may be smart enough to correctly identify a whale, he was not smart enough to stop talking about Carol and take the win. After he lost the election, Trump continued to trash talk Carol. So she sued him again in 2022, this time for remarks he made after he was no longer president. Uh, she also added a sexual assault claim. And when that case went to trial last year, a jury found Trump liable for assault and defamation. You can check out the first video that we did on that and the more than $5 million verdict that she received. In 2023, the Justice Department dropped its opposition to the original defamation lawsuit, clearing it to move forward. Basically, Trump repeated the same statements, so the government concluded that they could not have been part of his job as president, which was otherwise giving him immunity. Uh, New York also passed a law that allowed some previously time-barred sexual assault claims to go forward. And this is why the first trial was technically called Carol 2, and the second trial is part of the Carol 1 case regarding the uh, during presidential statements. And since there was a prior verdict on the merits, those facts and legal conclusions are established for all time, including, spoiler, other cases like this. And in 2023, the Justice Department dropped his opposition to the original defamation lawsuit, clearing it to move forward. Judge Lewis Kaplan, who presided over the first trial, ruled that as a matter of law, Trump defamed Carroll because of the 2023 verdict. So there's only one issue in the second trial, whether Carroll suffered damages when Trump defamed her in 2019 while he was president. Uh, Trump's usual defenses, uh, I never knew her, she didn't even go here, were off limits uh, for this trial because liability had already been determined in the other case. Haba's job was to prove that Carol didn't suffer any damages because of Trump's defamatory statements. So, uh, how did she do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Things actually got off to a rocky start when Trump's main lawyer, Joe Takapina, withdrew from the case. Takapina is a seasoned trial lawyer, and Haba is not. Haba might be an okay transactional lawyer, although frankly, we have uh, some evidence that she was uh, extremely underhanded in that role and should be disbarred, and uh, frankly, wasn't even good at it to begin with. But she's definitely not experienced in federal trial practice, and she was facing off against Carol's lawyer, Roberta Kaplan, who has won landmark cases at the Supreme Court. Now, you might recall in the first trial, Trump was only required to pay $5 million. Now, usually it's hard to run a natural experiment to see what would happen with a better lawyer. Uh, well, this isn't exactly apples to apples, but it's close. And it appears that a better lawyer is worth at least $78 million. But the controversy began when Trump's mother-in-law passed away a week before the trial was scheduled to start. Trump did what every devoted husband would do in this situation. He used the death to try to delay one of his trials. Haba said that Trump would be traveling to the funeral on the same day the trial was scheduled to start, January 17th, and therefore that he should get a one week delay. Judge Kaplan offered his condolences, but denied the request saying that, quote, the defendant is free to attend the funeral, the trial, or both. In a footnote, Judge Kaplan wrote, quote, the court subsequently learned that Mr. Trump has scheduled a campaign appearance at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, January 17th, 
2024 in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So that's basically judge speak for, I know you were lying when you previously represented to me. And despite his prior acting experience, uh, Trump had difficulty pulling off the role of grieving husband. Now, I'll note again that it's very dumb that federal courts often don't allow video and that this trial was not allowed to be televised. So a huge shout out once again to Matthew Russell Lee at the Inner City Press, who basically live tweeted the whole thing. But it's also possible that not all the nuance was captured, so take these live accounts with a grain of salt. Now, you might think that the delay issue was settled after the judge's ruling, but that's only because you're not thinking like Alina Haba. On the first day of trial, Haba asked the judge to postpone the trial, and Judge Kaplan said, quote, the application is denied, I will hear no further argument on it. Now, when a judge tells you he's done hearing an argument, he is really done, and you should probably shut up at that point. But not if you're Alina Haba. Uh, she tried to make the same motion, and Kaplan cut her off, stating, quote, None, do you understand that word? Sit down. Uh, Hoppa fired back, quote, I don't like to be spoken to that way, your honor. Uh, she asked to delay again, and he said, it's denied, sit down. It's stuff like this that Alina Haba would later refer to when she said that she was not allowed to speak in court and was told what to say. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're allowed to make an argument, just not over and over and over again. Now, after the jury was selected and trial got underway, uh, Haba struggled with applying the rules of evidence to get her exhibits admitted. When Hobbit was cross-examining Carol, she said, quote, many people called you a liar before the president made his statement. Uh, predictably, Robbie Kaplan objected on the grounds that Haba was making a statement, not asking a question. Haba then said, well, quote, I wasn't finished. It says here, you're a pathetic old hag. Uh, the it was a document that had yet to be admitted into evidence. So Judge Kaplan stopped Haba from continuing, quote, no, we are not going to read out loud a document that is not yet in evidence. We're going to take a break right here to 3.30 and you are going to refresh your memory about how you get a document in. This is so, so bad. It's the equivalent of a teacher saying, uh, you know, you're getting a timeout and think about what you did. Write the federal rules of evidence uh, 10 times on the blackboard. Uh, but an exhibit is a document or object that's used by either side in a lawsuit to prove a claim. Now you don't just get to pull out a document and ask a witness to look at it. First, you have to show the exhibit to the other party, the other lawyer. Then generally you need a witness to testify about the exhibit to demonstrate that it's authentic and relevant to the issues at stake. Uh, and this is known as uh, you know laying the foundation for an exhibit. And usually a lawyer then asks the judge, may I approach the witness to show them the document? And once you've identified the exhibit and laid the foundation, you ask the judge to admit it into evidence. Uh, then you can ask specific questions about what's inside of the document. But Haba didn't know how to do this. And things got so bad that Judge Kaplan started telling Haba how to admit her evidence step by excruciating step. And when Carol was on the witness stand, the judge said, quote, show it to her, ask her if she recognizes it. Haba did that, but she hadn't labeled the document. Judge Kaplan said, uh, it should be marked, do it appropriately, do it overnight. They need to be pre-marked. And this is extremely standard practice. Uh, even before evidence is admitted, you need to know how to reference it. It's so basic. It's so embarrassing uh, that I just wanna hide under my desk here. And it's not like a lawyer has to guess what the judge's rules are. All judges have standing orders to cover how they run their courtroom. Judge Kaplan's standing order states that he requires his exhibits to be pre-marked. See page seven, which states, quote, documents to be offered as exhibits shall not be attached to witness statements, but shall be pre-marked and exchanged along with other proposed exhibits in the usual fashion. Now, if you've ever been sued for defamation, you'll want a good lawyer, not Alina Haba. But if you want a great lawyer, my firm, the Eagle Team, can help. If you've been in a car crash, suffered from sexual harassment, or were in a data breach and got one of those data breach letters, we can represent you or help find you the right attorney who can. It's so important to talk to a lawyer right away so you don't lose your chance for a full recovery and maximize your options. So just click on the link in the description for a free consultation with my team. Because you don't just need a legal team, you need the Eagle Team. So click on the link below. But these mistakes are inexcusable, not just because they're so basic, but because if you don't know how to do this stuff, A, learn, it's not that hard, and B, you don't need to be the only attorney. You can hire local counsel who knows the local rules or at least knows how to try a case. Not everyone is a trial lawyer. That's okay, just get help. But not everything that went wrong was Haba's fault. In her defense, she does have potentially the world's worst client. Uh, Trump repeatedly spoke while Carol was testifying. That's not permitted. Uh, reporters heard Trump saying, quote, It's a witch hunt. And it, it really is a con job. Judge Kaplan excused the jury from the room and then said, quote, Mr. Trump, I hope I don't have to consider excluding you from the trial. I understand you're probably very eager for me to do that. Trump responded, quote, I, I would love it. This provoked Judge Kaplan to say, quote, I know you would. You just can't control yourself in these circumstances, apparently. Uh, Trump shot back. You can't either. So this is probably why it was reported that Joseph Takapina told Trump not to go near the courtroom uh, before he unceremoniously left the legal team. 
But Haba's trial work uh, didn't get any better. She allegedly came down with COVID-19 right before it was time for her to present her case. Uh, Haba said that her parents were sick with COVID and she had a fever. Uh, Judge Kaplan did grant her request to delay the trial until she got better. Uh, but the illness just happened to coincide with the New Hampshire primary, which Trump won. Haba was then caught partying at a Trump soiree in the Granite State. Here she is posing with Trump staffer Dylan Quadrucci. Uh, the Trump campaign kicked Quadrucci out of the event because he posted the selfie he took with her. This is how they treat loyalty in Trump world. I've done nothing but be extremely loyal to this man, and they kicked me out. So maybe now he'll switch from the Republican party to the leopards eating people's faces party. But the fake stickout delayed the day that Trump would finally take the witness stand. And when it finally happened, Judge Kaplan placed strict limits on his testimony since there had already been a trial on liability and Trump waived his right to testify. And during that trial, Joe Takapina told the judge that Trump had waived his right to testify and was resting his case. Judge Kaplan then had to break the news to Takapina that his client who was hanging out on a golf course in Ireland had just told the press that he was jetting back to New York to testify. I have to go back for a woman that made a false accusation about me. Uh, of course, uh, Trump never showed up. But this time around, Trump was in the building. However, as the judge said, quote, it is a very well-established legal principle in the country that prevents do-overs by disappointed litigants. And he's right, this is called collateral estoppel. It's the legal doctrine that prevents a party from relitigating an issue that was resolved in a prior lawsuit. So in light of that, the judge asked Haba what Trump would testify about. Uh, this is also an extremely standard thing, although that hasn't stopped Lena Haba from complaining about it. It's called a proffer. If there's a question about the suitability or admissibility of testimony, you can ask the lawyer to proffer what is going to be said to make sure. And Haba answered, quote, that he stands behind his deposition. I'll ask about his state of mind. He'll say he was defending himself. Now, the judge did give her the benefit of the doubt, but having Trump reaffirm his deposition testimony wasn't the best idea. As New York lawyer Mitchell Epner correctly explained, quote, it is actually going to be counterproductive. The jury is going to be instructed that the answers Trump gave during the deposition were not just false, but knowingly false and made with actual malice, which was required for the prior verdict. Reaffirming those answers will support punitives. In fact, Mitchell Epner did a one hour interview with Liz Dye about this case over at Liz's new podcast at lawandchaospod.com. I highly recommend you check it out. During this exchange, Trump started yelling from the gallery, quote, I wasn't at the trial, I never met this woman. This pissed off Judge Kaplan, quote, Mr. Trump, keep your voice down. Uh, he asked Haba for assurances that her client would abide by his instructions. Haba said she, quote, didn't have a crystal ball about what he would do. Judge Kaplan told Haba that she could ask Trump if he stood by his deposition testimony. Haba balked, saying she needed to ask Trump what his intentions were when he made the defamatory statements. Uh, Judge Kaplan said that the topic was off limits. Quote, I will decide what he has a right to do here. That's my job, not yours. Judge Kaplan told Haba not to ask Trump an open-ended question, warning her that, quote, if you ask it, there is likely to be an objection and I'm likely to sustain it. With that settled, Trump started talking loudly again. And as NBC's Katie Fang reported, Trump says out loud in court before the jury is brought back in, I don't know who this woman is, never met this woman. Judge Kaplan warned him, Mr. Trump, keep your voice down. You're interrupting these proceedings while your counsel is talking and that is not permitted. When the jury re-entered the courtroom, Haba announced she's calling President Donald Trump uh, to the witness stand, but this got under Judge Kaplan's uh, skin. And Trump immediately did what the judge warned him not to do, contest the substance of the allegations that he sexually assaulted Carol. Right out of the gate, Haba asked, do you deny these allegations? And Trump says, I consider it a false accusation. And the testimony was stricken. Remember, all this was already established as a matter of law in the first trial. The testimony was stricken because the merits of the case were already decided in the first case. Collateral estoppel is quite a uh, big issue. Haba also asked, uh, did you ever instruct anyone to hurt Miss Carroll? Trump said, I just wanted to defend myself, my family, and frankly, the presidency. On cross-examination, Roberta Kaplan asked if this was the only trial that he attended, and he said yes, and she had no further questions. And as lawyer Renato Mariotti points out, this was a smart move. Quote, any question she asked would give him an opportunity to riff on irrelevant subjects and get his story out in front of the jury, which he and his lawyer haven't done well otherwise. Now, on the last day of trial, Haba and her client were late to court. Uh, things got worse when Haba and her co-counsel tried to show the jury a slide of tweets that had not been admitted into evidence. Uh, Judge Kaplan told Haba, Quote, you are on the verge of spending some time in the lockup. Now sit down. See, Carol's team had apparently agreed to stipulate to let those tweets in, but Haba had forgotten to put that into evidence during the actual trial. Again, even if the other side agrees, you still have to lay the foundation and admit it into evidence. I think anyone that has seen any random episode of Law & Order would know this. 
Uh, during closing, Haba claimed that Trump was being denied his constitutional rights. Quote, ladies and gentlemen, in our country, you have a constitutional right to speak. Kaplan smacked that down saying, you have a constitutional right to do some kinds of speech and not others. Haba questioned whether Trump knew Carol and whether he actually assaulted her. When Judge Kaplan reminded the jury that it's been established that Carol told the truth about Trump sexually assaulting her, uh, Haba snapped back saying, quote, it is established by a jury. Uh, Judge Kaplan said, it's established and you will not quarrel with me, you will finish your statement. Haba also tried her hand at comedy, telling the jury that Carol wasn't the only person in America who got death threats on Twitter. Quote, ladies and gentlemen, I received three this week alone. That's me on a good day. Not surprisingly, Judge Kaplan told her she was out of line and struck that remark. Again, <laughs> closing arguments rely on the evidence that was admitted into court. Uh, you can't just talk about random stuff that happened to you. But again, all this is supposed to relate only to damages. So Haba was on slightly stronger ground when she told the jury that Carol's life was better after the defamation. Quote, she's enjoying this. Let's not forget the fact that Miss Carol is making more money now than in 2019 when she brought this up. On the other hand, as Carol's lawyer put it, quote, Donald Trump acts as if these rules of law just don't apply to him. Uh, that touched a nerve with Trump who got up and stormed out of the courtroom. When Trump's quasi lawyer, Boris Epstein tried to run after him, uh, the judge said no one else at the defense counsel table was allowed to leave. Quote, that includes you, Mr. Epstein. Carroll used evidence of Trump's wealth from the New York attorney general case where he's desperately trying to show that he has a lot of money. Uh, so probably in an effort to avoid prejudicing himself in that case, Trump didn't really dispute any of that evidence, which helped Carroll establish that the punitive damages needed to be high to actually incentivize him to stop his conduct. Carol's lawyers told the jurors that Trump will continue to defame Carol, quote, unless you make it stop. They showed the jury two videos of Trump making jokes about Carol. The first was just hours after the first verdict. Uh, the second happened uh, at a CNN town hall the day after the verdict where Trump's Carol is an ugly liar routine got big laughs from the audience. I have no idea who the hell, she's a Mr. whack President, job. You, you did not. So Carol's attorneys asked for $12 million to repair her reputation and at a minimum of $12 million for emotional harm. Uh, these are compensatory damages. Carol also asked the jury to award punitive damages. Punitive damages are only allowable when there's a high degree of intentionality and moral turpitude, and the goal of uh, punitive damages is to deter the defendant from engaging in similar conduct in the future. And we already know that Trump finds it difficult, nay impossible, uh, not to engage in similar conduct because he defamed Carol right after the first Carol trial and was tweeting about her the night before closing arguments. So not surprisingly, the jury awarded Carol 7.3 million in compensatory damages for emotional harm, $11 million to cover the costs of a media campaign to restore her reputation, and $65 million in punitive damages. But Trump didn't present an opposing expert to dispute the amount that it would take to repair Carol's reputation, which is probably something that you'd want to do in a damages only trial. And you can see that instead of signing the verdict form, the jurors are listed by number. Uh, that's because Judge Kaplan decided that the jury should be anonymous for their own personal safety. Uh, and before he dismissed them for the last time, the judge said, quote, my advice to you is that you never disclose that you were on this jury. Now, Trump wasn't present when the verdict was read. He left the courthouse 20 minutes beforehand, uh, evidently choosing not to be on hand for the humiliating verdict. It's likely that Trump will appeal. The Supreme Court has held that punitive damages violate the due process clause if the amount is grossly excessive. And what's grossly excessive is up for debate. In a case that involves State Farm Insurance, a jury awarded the plaintiff $1 million in compensatory damages and $145 million in punitives. And the Supreme Court said that that was excessive because it was neither reasonable nor proportionate to the wrong committed by the defendant. So a ratio of 145 to one was just too high. And in 1996, in a case called BMW versus Gore, the Supreme Court created three factors to determine whether to uphold a punitive damages award. One, the degree of reprehensibility of the defendant's conduct. Uh, two, the ratio of punitive damages to compensatory damages, and usually a single digit multiplier is allowable. And three, comparing sanctions that have been imposed for comparable misconduct. And here, the punitive damages are actually likely to hold up. The ratio of punitives to compensatory damages is about 3.5x, and everyone is assuming that Trump will appeal, and he might, but to stay the execution of the judgment, that is, to prevent Carol from immediately collecting from Trump, he would need to post a bond. Now, generally, in the Southern District of New York, you need to post 110% of the value of the judgment. And usually, you would go to a bond company and have them post it you would pay the bond company a very small fraction of the bond value and they post the bond. The bond company gets to keep about 1%. But the weird thing is that in the first Carroll trial, Trump posted the bond in cash. He paid the full amount directly to the court. Now his lawyer said that that was to avoid the 1% bond fee or about $55,000 on a $5 million bond. But it's also possible that no bond company was actually willing to work with him. And who knows what's gonna happen here.
But if he doesn't post the bond, then Carroll can start enforcing the judgment by seizing uh, Trump's assets and putting liens on his property, which would be especially bad for Trump because many of his assets are public and well-known, making them a lot easier to seize. And Hobbes bad lawyering may also come back to bite Trump on appeal as well. Because she often let in evidence without objection and fumbled so many of the issues, she likely didn't preserve a lot of the otherwise appealable issues. It, generally, you need to make your argument in the trial court and preserve issues in the trial court to be allowed to bring those issues up on appeal. And if you don't, you waive those issues. Anyway, hired competent counsel, kids. But the big question is whether this verdict will actually stop Trump from ranting about Carol. But as Ellie Mistal points out uh, in Trump's first comments after the verdict, he specifically did not mention Carol by name. So maybe punitives do work. But right now, Alina Hoppe probably just wants to disappear from the face of the planet. Luckily, today's sponsor, Incogni, can help. Because Incogni removes your personal data from online data brokers to help you stay private. They'll reach out to make sure it's taken down, and if these data brokers object, which I've seen in my case, Incogni will take care of that too and make sure that they take it down. Uh, have you been getting a ton of spam emails, calls, and texts? I know I have, and it's probably in part because online data brokers have your data and sell it to unscrupulous advertisers. Now, I don't know if you've ever Googled yourself, but there are major people search sites that probably have your personal contact info. It might be because of a data hack, but sometimes our friends and family even provide that information voluntarily by clicking on one of those boxes when they sign up for a website or an app. These sites provide in-depth records, including information like your home address, contact details, license plate numbers, family members, financial information, and even religious and political affiliation. These sites can expose you to a wide range of dangers from scams to identity theft to online harassment and stalking. And it was really important to me that I not be on those sites and Incogni took that information down. And not only does Incogni stop marketing efforts, but it also reduces your risk of information being part of a data breach or use an identity theft or stalking that you really don't want to take a chance with. But if you have been in a data breach, please let me know. Uh, but data brokers are required to remove your personal information from their database if you ask them to, but tackling this by yourself would be nearly impossible. But that's where Incogni comes in. Incogni fights on your behalf to remove your personal data from brokers and deals with any objections on their side. All you have to do is create an account and give them approval to work on your behalf. Incogni conducts repeated ongoing removals because even if the data broker removes your data once, they can collect it again and use it again. Incogni makes sure that your personal information stays off the market for good. Here's my personal Incogni dashboard. It showed me that these three sites had data on me that was rated 10 out of 10 on Incogni's sensitivity scale. These brokers had data including my contacts, financial data, and health data. It was terrifying to see exactly how many brokers had my data, but it's really fun to watch Incogni get them to delete that info one by one. So if online privacy is important to you, give Incogni a try. Click on the link below to get 60% off Incogni when you use the code LegalEagle. Again, to get an exclusive 60% off discount, just click on the link that's on screen right now or down in the description and use the code LegalEagle. After that, click on this link over here for more Legal Eagle, or I'll see you in court.